Um, Simon is uh, the Emerging Markets Editor at The Economist, uh, the magazine, The Economist. He has written a number of special reports and white papers on topics ranging from the world's recovery from the global financial crisis, um, the resilience of China's economy, and the technological ambitions of India and China. He also, in 2008, edited the Growth Report, which was published by the Commission on Growth and Development and chaired by the Nobel laureate economist Michael Spence. Uh, he has contributed to the Oxford Companion to the Economics of China, and he also invented the Li Keqiang Index, uh, which is an unofficial indicator of China's economic performance, uh, which I think he invented in response to a comment that Li Keqiang himself made, saying he didn't believe his own government's official GDP numbers and used alternative indicators to measure economic performance. Uh, Simon has studied at uh, the University of Cambridge, Harvard, and the London School of Economics. Simon. Uh, thank you, Sujata. Um, and thank you, Simeon. It's a very interesting presentation and a, a great report. Congratulations. I, I remember uh, many years ago in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, talking to another journalist, a somewhat more cynical journalist, and I said to him, um, oh, the World Development Report's coming out. What do you think it will say? And he said, the WDI always says the same thing. It says um, development's really complicated. Everything's connected, and it's all going to require a lot of money particularly donations from rich countries to poorer countries. And you know, these aren't necessarily criticisms of the World Development Report. All three things are true of development. But I have to say it is refreshing to, to read a, a report that diverges from this stereotype, or at least diverges 50% uh, from this stereotype. Uh, this report does say that a lot of things are connected. There is a thread that ties together what would otherwise be a terribly wide-ranging report. Uh, uh, Simeon's already alluded to it, the introduction of technologies, particularly digital technologies, changing the nature of jobs, changing the nature of firms, both of which will require quite heavy investments in more and different kinds of human capital, uh, both of which will also require us to recast social protection. Uh, doing those two things will demand quite a lot of resources. Unfortunately, technology is also eroding traditional tax bases, uh, both payroll-based and corporate income taxes. Uh, and so the report has a number of proposals that go far beyond aid about how to raise revenue. So there is a thread connecting it. Um, there was also, though, quite a lot that's surprising in the report, things I didn't expect to find, things that push back, I think, I think against uh, conventional wisdom and prevailing narratives. Uh, I've identified three of them here. Um, first is a certain optimism about technology, or at least a pushback against the more... Um, uh, apocalyptic predictions for technology. Uh, the second is this idea that premature deindustrialization might be somewhat overblown or misreported. And the third, there are some kind words about big firms. Uh, we're so used to hearing praise for micro-entrepreneurs and micro-enterprise, it was refreshing to hear some uh, praise for the larger firms that employ many people and give many people an opportunity to invest in their own education. So I'm going to touch on uh, all three of these insofar as time allows. Um, so first, not everyone is afraid of technology. Well, uh, Simon alluded to this. Um, if you look at the range of estimates for how many jobs are susceptible to automation, the range is incredibly wide. I'm a journalist. As a journalist, we'll always go for the high figure. But there's a lot of low figures out there that are much less newsworthy and therefore underreported. Uh, for the US, the high figure is 47%. But there's also an estimate that it's just 7% of jobs are at risk of automation. Uh, for Japan, the range is even wider. And interestingly, in Japan, people aren't terribly afraid of technology. They're afraid of many things. Technology isn't one of them. Um, I remember uh, visiting um, uh, a town in um, uh, Ibaraki Prefecture outside of Tokyo. And it's a town that had really embraced robotics. Even the local basketball team was called the Ibaraki Robots. Um, apparently, they're not very good. Um, and, and one of the more prominent firms in that town has developed this uh, robotic exoskeleton you see here. Now, this is clearly a complement to human labor. Uh, indeed, they produce a version of it that's like a back brace for people working in warehouses or nursing homes who have to lift uh, heavy uh, weights. Um, this is not a threat to labor. It's a, uh, a 
and uh, augmentation of labor, if you like, and explains perhaps why this, this part of Japan was particularly um, enthusiastic about technology. In fact, um, they're so unafraid of technophobia um, that they almost play games with the technophobes. Um, this technology, this uh, exoskeleton, is called a human-assisted limb, uh, or HAL for short. And those of you who are movie buffs will remember that the rogue computer in 2001, A Space Odyssey, was called HAL. This is the computer that killed all the astronauts. And the company itself is called Cyberdyne, which those of you who remember the Terminator films will remember this is the name of the, the company in Terminator. And indeed, in the, in the foyer of this firm, there is a, a Terminator robot uh, greeting visitors. Um, this is me trying on the suit, somewhat less uh, intimidating. <laughs> so not everyone's afraid of technology, and the report does a good job of presenting both sides of that issue. But clearly, some technologies are a substitute for labor rather than a complement to it. And that's contributed to fears of what, what's been called premature deindustrialization. Um, the best way to describe this is to start with what's deindustrialization. The traditional view of deindustrialization is that countries industrialize, uh, manufacturing is a share of employment, and GDP goes up. Then they reach a certain level of prosperity and shift towards services. The idea of premature deindustrialization is that this peak happens earlier and at a lower level. Uh, people st uh, countries start deindustrializing before they get rich and before a very big share of the uh, workforce is actually in manufacturing. And so if you go around countries and look at them individually, you do see quite a lot of this going on. Uh, Mexico, surprisingly, its manufacturing share of employment peaked um, somewhere around 2000. Um, I visited uh, this site. This was where um, the Ford Motor Company was going to build a factory uh, to produce cars uh, shortly before Trump was elected. And then he started tweeting about how awful this was. And they backed away and decided to make the cars in Michigan instead. And so you have seen some evidence of this kind of pressure on manufacturing employment, certainly in parts of Latin America. But as Simeon pointed out, it's not really that manufacturing employment in the developing world as a whole is falling. It's just shifting. It's shifted to places like China and increasingly now away from China into other parts of East Asia. So it's not premature deindustrialization for the emerging world as a whole. And indeed, some countries will uh, hope to capture some of those manufacturing jobs that are now leaving China. Um, the third interesting uh, and somewhat counterintuitive claims made in the report are about the role of big firms. Um, I was surprised to read this particularly because, um, as Simeon mentioned, one of his uh, intellectual heroes, I think, is Hernando de Soto, the Peruvian economist, who's written very eloquently about the spirit of enterprise that exists in some of the poorest parts of the world. Um, these are some quotes from his book, uh, The Mystery of Capital. It's, it's this idea that the poor already have assets. They just need to animate them. Uh, it's the idea that many people who now work as micro-entrepreneurs could become the successful capitalists of the future, and if they were given more secure property rights, you would have a blossoming of popular capitalism. Now, there's a lot of truth in this, and again, if you go around um, poorer parts of the world, uh, you will obviously see a tremendous amount of this entrepreneurial spirit. Um, this is uh, a barrio, a, a favela almost, uh, but in Buenos Aires, Villa 31. And you'll meet all sorts of entrepreneurs. Uh, this lady is selling skewers from a shopping cart. And the government's actually investing quite a lot of money in trying to formalize these businesses, refurbish them, uh, give them more secure title. But the report actually has a number of interesting things to say about this endeavor. It argues that many of these efforts aren't cost effective. It also points out that many people are entrepreneurs not because they want to be, but because they have to be. And their aspirations aren't actually to become big firms. Their aspirations are to get jobs in big firms, if only there was more formal employment available. So I was quite interested and surprised uh, to read those sentiments in uh, this report. Um, one of De Soto's most memorable lines, he's asked, well, if these um, uh, entrepreneurs have no property title, how do you know where one person's property begins and another person's property ends? And he said, well, you listen out for the dogs barking. When one person's dog stops barking and another's starts, you know you've crossed the property boundary. Uh, and that also checks out uh, in this part of Buenos Aires. You do see the dogs keeping watch. So those were three surprising things I saw in this report. Um, I want to turn, though, to what I guess is the empirical centerpiece of the report, which is the, the Human Capital Index. Um, 
And one can ask, you know, how new is this really? I mean, we've seen things that are a little bit similar to this for some time. As Simeon mentioned, the United Nations Human Development Index, which combines per capita GDP, uh, life expectancy, and uh, years of schooling. And you get somewhat similar results if you use that index. But I think what's new and interesting about the Human Capital Index, as opposed to the Human Development Index, is a lot about how they weight these different components. It might sound boring and technical, but I think it's quite important. The weights for the Human Development Index, the old index, are essentially arbitrary. And this doesn't actually matter that much when you're just trying to measure how well countries are doing. But it does matter when you're trying to motivate governments to improve. Because the weights will really um, uh, influence how effective different policies will be in raising your score on these indices. So, for example, if a country's government was uh, ashamed of its position in the Human Development Index, it might say to its advisors, you know, how can we improve our score? And the advisors might say, well, you can either um, invest in uh, more innovation, foreign direct investment to improve your per capita GDP, or you could just keep people in school for longer. And you know, by assumption, these two policies might have the same effect on the index, but we have no reason to believe they're making the same contribution to that society's well-being. So it's essentially an arbitrary weighting. Um, the World Bank's new Human Capital Index tries to go one step beyond this. It tries to give the weights economic meaning. In particular, it looks at the contribution of education versus the contribution of health to productivity. And it says, you know, if you fall short of their ideal, um, how much does this detract from your productivity? And that determines the weight it gets in the index. Now, we can perhaps talk a little bit more about whether the data or the economic research is good enough to actually make the index work in the way it's intended. But it's clearly a step forward from the rather arbitrary weights of the past. And that's important, as I say, not so much for measurement, but for motivation. And that matters because governments do sometimes take these exercises very seriously. Uh, Simeon, as was mentioned, used to uh, run the Doing Business Project, which does concentrate minds all around the world. Some governments take it far too seriously, frankly. So it's good that there's some uh, less arbitrariness in the way this index works. I mean, I'll show you the results. Um, so this is the top 10 countries in the new Human Capital Index. And I, I bet there's someone in the Hong Kong government now who's saying fourth. Well, fourth is pretty good. But look, Singapore is top. We need to try and beat them. Um, these get your competitive spirits going. Um, you can compare them to football league tables. I mean, at the moment, we're basically the arsenal of human capital. <laughs> but there'll be someone saying we want to be Manchester City. Thank you very much. <laughs>